And I'll welcome you all. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Worcester Art Museum. Um, we're excited to welcome you to the Master Series program tonight. I'll just share this slide for one second here. For next Thursday, we will be having um, our last program that goes along with our exhibition, The Kimono in Print, 300 Years of Japanese Design, um, Thursday, April 22nd. Pictured here, you see Michiko Karada, who did traditional dances at the Worcester Art Museum sort of privately, but we recorded them and she's going to have a Zoom discussion. They'll be broadcast on Zoom or Facebook Live, however you wanna join us next Thursday, talking about the dances, how she wears kimono, um, the sort of style of wedding kimonos. We've had a lot of questions come up during the exhibition and I think she will answer a lot of those questions about wearing the kimono. Um, so, you know, the exhibition is up until May 2nd. Um, we also just opened this past weekend the Neumann exhibition, um, What the Nazis Stole from Richard Neumann and the Search to Get It Back. Um, so that has also opened if you're interested in visiting the Worcester Art Museum. Both those exhibitions and the museum in general, you just want to book your ticket online um, because of the time ticketing. So even if you're a member, um, just sign up online and you can come in that way. So hopefully you will join us. And we're excited tonight. We have been waiting for this discussion with Monica Vinchik from the Metropolitan Museum of Art for about two years now, because we had her scheduled when we thought this was opening last spring. Um, and she has been very patient with our scheduling um, and is here tonight to present to us Kimono Fashion in Kyoto um, for this master series. You know, the master series is sponsored by our members council. They present it. And our lead sponsor this year is ABV. And we thank them for their continued support of these programs. Um, we're able to bring in scholars to talk to us about works. And she will be talking about Kimono tonight, which are really featured in that um, exhibition. And she has um, a great experience working with Japanese decorative arts. She is a Japanese liqueur specialist. She grew up in Hungary, but has studied and spent extensive time in Kyoto, which is where our kimono was created by the Chizo Company. Um, she's working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and their Japanese decorative arts. She is also planning a kimono exhibition for that museum that will open and has created kimono exhibition in the past. So I think her presentation tonight, looking at the history of kimono and how people have seen it, um, the kimono through, you know, we have some prints, she's gonna present a lot more of some older kimono that are in different collections. And also I'm supposed to point out, I see in the chat, I am wearing our Chiso scarf that was created to go along with the kimono, which is available in the Worcester Art Museum shop. So I'm just a model tonight. If you would like to purchase this, you can contact the shop. And now I would love to welcome uh, Monica Vinchik to lead us in this great discussion tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Eileen. It is my great pleasure to be with you tonight. And I really look forward to this talk about fashion in Kyoto. Kyoto is my second hometown, so I'm excited to talk about trends in uh, kimono fashion. So without further ado, let me share my screen and start the presentation. Throughout most of its history, kimono, the traditional Japanese clothing, remained relatively consistent in its structure and silhouette. The shape and structure rarely changed regardless of the wearer's class or gender. All personal details appear on the surface, reflected in the colors, patterns, and details adorning the kimono. Originally, the kimono means a thing to wear. Kimono, as we know them today, appeared during the 11th century in the Heian period. Kimono are traditionally made from a single bolt of fabric called a ten in Japanese. A ten has a standard dimensions about 14 inches wide and about 42 feet long. And the entire bolt is used to make one kimono. 
The finished kimono consists of four main strips of fabric, two panels covering the body, two panels forming the sleeves, with additional smaller strips forming the narrow front panels and collar. Kimono for men should fall approximately to the ankle. A woman's kimono has additional length to allow for the ohashuri, the tuck that can be seen under the obisesh, which is used to adjust the kimono to the wearer's height. An ideally tailored kimono has sleeves that fall to the wrist when the arms are lowered. The kimono and obi are traditionally made of hemp, linen, silk, brocaded silk, silk crepe, and all kinds of satin waves adjusted to the season and uh, to the patterns. Silk is the best choice to make a kimono. The simplicity of construction meant that kimono could be made at home. In the Edo period from the 17th century through the 19th century, mainly in the countryside and in rural areas, people had their own loom and a wife responsibility included making the kimono for the family. The exquisite silk kimono that we are going to talk about today were made by specialist workshops in Kyoto and Edo. Fashion was a big business in Japan, especially the ones we are going to discuss today. And it was supported by extensive network that included weavers, dyers, embroiderers, specialist thread suppliers, stencil maker, and designers. At the heart of the industry were the drapery stores, the most famous of which was the Echigoya in Edo, which was founded in 1673. Today, we are going to talk about the early history of kimono going back to medieval times and focusing on the 17th and 18th century. In the beginning of its history, the kimono was not called the kimono, it was called kosode. It is very, very similar to the kimono as we know it today. However, the structure is slightly different. The kosode is on the left side of my screen, the traditional kimono is on the right side. So can you, you can immediately see the difference. The kosode is much wider. The shapes of the sleeves are different. They are rounded and the front panel is much wider. The length is again different. The kosode is shorter. So it's generally speaking a much looser garment. It's, it's not following the shape of the body and the kosode uh, were worn with very small obi, very uh, narrow obi sash, as you can see on the mannequin. So the um, garment had a very different feel from the kimono as we know it today. Let me explain a little bit about the development of the kosode. Going back to the Heian period to the 11th century, which as I mentioned, the time period when the kimono structure emerged, um, has two types of garments. One was the so-called kosode, which means small sleeve opening, and the osode, which means large sleeve opening. I'm showing you two paintings from the 11th century. On the left side, you can see commoners, women working in the kitchen, and because they need to do physical labor, it was more practical to have a small sleeve opening so they can use their arm freely. On the right side of the screen, you can see aristocratic ladies in the 12 layer court robes, which were called Juni Hitoe. And they have large sleeve openings because they didn't have to do physical work. And this is the big difference in the development of the garment. The small sleeve opening, which is the characteristic of the kosode, is coming from a functional structure. And the large sleeve opening, the osode, which was worn by aristocrats, always remained a court robe. So um, they were not uh, used in uh, physical activities. Um, the next slide shows you one of the earliest surviving garments. As you can imagine, um, silk 
garments are very fragile. So there are very few ancient robes remaining in Japan. This one goes back to the 13th century. And this is the closest existing example of the earliest Heian period shape of the garment. You can see that the garment is relatively wide. The front panel is wide. The collar is relatively wide. And it, it has a very loose silhouette. This was actually a court robe for a uh, high ranking aristocratic woman. It's made of silk with a phoenix design, phoenix patterns. And this is a really a good example to understand how the shape of the contemporary kimono developed in Japan. Uh, this garment survived from the 13th century because it was um, an offering to a shrine, the Tsurugaoka Hachimangu, and the Shinto priests uh, took very good care of this garment and it didn't see a lot of sunlight and of course it was not used. Another example from the 16th century, the Momoyama period, also showing the um, kosode shape, very wide uh, back panels, rounded sleeves, and generally speaking, a loose silhouette. This one was designed for a no actor. No is one of the traditional theater forms in Japan. And this luxurious garment was made of white silk and uh, decorated with very rich embroidery showing uh, cherry blossoms, maple leaves, um, all kinds of flowers and plants of the four seasons. I would like to call your attention to the pattern, how the embroidery is distributed. It can be found only on the shoulders and at the hem in a beautiful pattern, which is to imitate a river bank. It is again, a very rare garment. It's an important cultural property in the collection of the Tokyo National Museum. Very few garments survived from the 16th century. Another type of garment, again, from the 16th century, which is called a nuihaku, you can immediately tell the difference. The silhouette is very similar. These sleeves are somewhat shorter and um, rounded, but the pattern fills out the whole surface of the kimono. It is a very, very rich embroidery, a very beautiful, thick um, stitches, depicting all kinds of plants and flowers, including uh, billows with snow and irises depicted over uh, a bridge, which is a scene from the Tales of Issa. We are going to uh, learn more about this pattern later. This very elaborate no costume was in the Mori family, one of the uh, daimyo families in Japan, and it was made for a no actor. It was a very expensive garment and it was a gift from the Mori family to a no actor. And that was the utmost luxury in the 16th century. I very often received the question, uh, what was the men's fashion at that time? Um, again, Men's kimono rarely survive because they are not so elaborate as women's kimono or the no costumes. And from the 16th century, from the Momoyama period, we have a few um, overcoat that were worn by shoguns and high ranking samurai. The dobuku robe on the left side of the screen was uh, given to a high ranking samurai from Tokugawa Ieyasu the first shogun. It is a beautiful silk coat with diagonal stripes, ginkgo leaves and snow patterns. It is in the taste of the Momoyama period, very rich. And if you imagine paintings from the same time period, lacquers or ceramics, they really have the same bold taste that represented the um, taste of the samurai and uh, especially the emerging shogunate. On the right side, I'm showing a detail of a early 17th century painting. And this is a scene from the streets of Kyoto. You can see 
commoners and samurai wearing a similar garment, of course, not as luxurious, not as elaborate than this one from Tokugawa Iyasu, but there is a very simple kimono. It's usually brown or indigo dyed blue. Maybe it has stripes, but very, very subdued patterns. And over the kimono, they have an overcoat, which is also relatively simple and not as um, beautiful as this example. But this is um, you, immediately what you can tell that the men's kimono over uh, relatively simple, simple compared to the women's uh, kosode or kimono. Still, um, I would like to mention another type of garment that was popular with high-ranking samurai, the so-called jimbaori or surcoat, which was worn over armor. This one is again from the Momoyama period, the late 16th century. And this is one of my recent acquisitions. I bought it for the museum in 2017. And it has a very interesting story. When the, the, Portu when the Portuguese arrived in Japan in 1543, Japan became involved in global trade. High-ranking samurai wore these luxurious battle coats or jimbaori made from expensive in more imported fabrics. This elegant jimbaori is a very rare type. Only three similar examples are known, all of which belong to high-ranking warriors associated with either Toyotomi Hidayoshi or the shogun Tokugawa Iyasu. This surcoat has a pleated skirt, which is made of imported Chinese brocaded silk with a gold and silver dragon and cloud design. The vest, is made of wool imported from Europe, which was an exotic material in late 16th century Japan. They had no wool. On the back of the vest, there is a family crest. This is the family crest of the Naito family, a lies of Tokugawa Iyasu. And this is an applique in white wool felt and decorated with very refined cording. You can see the cording at the outline of the white crest. Um, this is really a luxurious and um, expensive garment that was probably given by Iyasu uh, to his loyal samurai. Let me share a few details. So on the left side, you can see the color of the garment from the front and see the beautiful brocaded silk. It's very luxurious, made with gold thread. And what is interesting is the shape of the color was um, inspired by Western garments. So this example shows the interest of the Japanese in European garments. Also, of course, the, as I mentioned, the exotic fabric, which is the wool or felt, but the shape of the color is really exciting because it was copied from the um, Western um, type of garment. On the right side, you can see the fingers of my uh, colleague, my, our conservator, uh, because we were looking at the ruffles at the um, west. And the ruffles were very bright, a combination of white silk, crepe silk with br very bright red crepe. But unfortunately, the red is extremely light sensitive because it's a vegetable based dye. So it faded over the hundreds of years and now it looks orange, but originally, and as um, she's opening it up, you can see the inside and the original beautiful red ruffle. And as you can tell, it's a uh, very luxurious garment and extremely stylish. This Kosade is again in the Metropolitan Museum's collection is among the earliest surviving kosade from the early 17th century. The natural scenery of Japan's coast with its beaches and shells and seagrasses inspired the delicate embroidered design. The foundation fabric woven in an intricate key thread pattern with floral motifs was likely imported from China in its white undecorated state. It was then resist dyed 
to achieve the effect of irregular sandbanks and the marine motifs were embroidered on the top. The alternating bands of light blue were further embellished with gold leaf accents. So again, it was made for a very high ranking samurai lady and it's very luxurious. The silk is coming from China and the embroidery is extremely refined, beautiful silk thread was used to create the shells and the seaweed. And uh, it's uh, in the um, original Kosode shape, as you can immediately tell from the slide on the left. As I mentioned, there are very few garments uh, that survived from the 16th century or the medieval times. So for fashion historians and textile historians in Japan, paintings are extremely important to recover the history of uh, the Kosode. These screens, again in the Mets collection, are called Who's Sleeves, Tagasode in Japanese, and they are dated to the early 17th century. There is a classical love poem with the phrase whose sleeves, and it refers to an absent woman whose beautiful robes evoke memories of the owner. A number of screen bearing this uh, name depict sumptuously patterned kimonos draped over lacquered clothing stand. This example display fashionable textile patterns of the late 16th through the early 17th century. Some of the robes have delicate tie-dye patterns, found spots or kanoko shibori, representing the refinement of the Kyoto taste. Beginning in the medieval period, Kyoto was known for its textile industry, centered what is known the Nishijin district. Empress consort Tofu Komunin, wife of the emperor Gomizu no, frequently ordered richly ornamented garments from Karegania, a textile shop located in the Nishijin district. But as you will buy more than 40 types and 40 examples of these uh, Tagasode screens, artisans from various painting school depicted uh, the kimono draped over rope stands, including lacquer and bamboo stands. These are painted with mineral pigments on gold foil or gold leaf background. So they were actually quite expensive and very luxurious. However, there are no human figures in the paintings. The hint of the human presence is just suggested by the clothing accessories. You can see a beautiful locker box on the right side of the screen. And um, basically the idea is that the title, Who Sleeves or Tagasode, invites you to guess who might have been the beauty who owns all these beautiful garments. And of course, because it's a love poem, you can think about a meeting with her lover in the room and sometimes a men's garment mixed together with the uh, female Kosode. However, uh, the representations of these clothing stands with lavish garments uh, appeared in hand scroll paintings and woodblock printed books as well. Similar compositions were published in books for women as guides, how to display garments. Actual garments were draped over in the homes of wealthy women either as a decorative uh, space divider or just to air them out. So the similar composition, kimonos draped over these tents could be seen in the homes of wealthy women, which might have inspired these compositions. Another theory why these compositions were created is that these screens were actually advertisements for textile shops and they were used to invite guests to purchase similar beautiful kosode. Another 17th century screen, uh, the uh, Matsura screen, I'm showing a detail, shows uh, courtesans uh, playing shamisen, engaged in card games, playing the shogi. 
singing, uh, writing poetry. And this is one of the earliest representations of full figures. It is very rare that you can see the women engaged in leisurely pursuits and wearing very, very fashionable kimono or kosode, which reflects the, the taste of the early 17th century. As you can see, the patterns fill in the full surface of the kosode and tiny small patterns are very fashionable, almost covering the ground of the kimono. I'm showing another screen um, from the Mets collection, which is called uh, Women's Kabuki. And this composition is based on a young woman dressed as a samurai performing the kabuki skit Chaya Asabi or Tea House Entertainment. You can see the stage on the left side of the screen, surrounded by spectators. On the right side, people are arriving to enjoy the kabuki. It's again Kyoto. Uh, people are crossing the Kamogawa River. And um, what is really, really exciting about this screen, which was painted around um, uh, 1610, is that it captures the taste of the time, the taste of Kyoto. Uh, you can see the spectators that includes commoners, samurai, uh, including men and women. And it's an extremely helpful source for textile historian to study the colors, to study the patterns, and to analyze what was in fashion in the time. Um, I will uh, show you two more details to um, focus on the garments. I'm going to show you the stage. As I mentioned, um, in the earliest phase, Kabuki was performed by female dancers or courtesans playing both men and women in sexually provocative skits. Kabuki, as we know it today, um, is a respected form of classical theater with complex plots performed only by male actors in both men and women's role did not emerge until the end of the 17th century. So this is a very early, um, form of kabuki. And in the middle of the stage, you can see a young woman in very fashionable clothing uh, with a sword. And she is playing the role of a young samurai. In front of her, at the edge of the stage, a young woman playing a, 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 a servant called young monkey holding a branch of maple leaves. Surrounded. Um, they are surrounded by musicians, again, in very, very fashionable kimono with all kinds of uh, striped patterns, flower patterns, even uh, gold embroidery. And these patterns are really, really extravagant. These young men and women were called kabukimono. And this name was given to people who gave rise to a particular social trend between the um, end of the 16th century and the early 17th century. Their style was particularly in fashion at that time in the um, uh, main areas of uh, Kyoto. They liked unusual things, eccentric fashion, and they did not behave uh, properly. So kabukimono was actually a negative term. Um, at that time, the uh, typical men uh, kimono, as I mentioned, was very quiet with subtle colors with um, very small stripe. But these young men loved uh, colors and uh, very daring motifs. Uh, they sometimes used um, animal skin to decorate their kimono. And this style, which uh, was um, developed in Kyoto, had a major impact on the mainstream fashion from the 1660s. So it is really interesting to see how these um, sort of avant-garde um, fashion conscious young men um, transmitted their sense of style to high-ranking samurai ladies later. I'm going to show you examples 
of uh, the new style that developed based on the kabuki mono's taste. Another detail from the same screen, as I discussed the hood sleeve screens, you can see a detail when um, the actors are uh, dressing or changing. They have mirrors on stands and lacquer boxes with cosmetics, and they have the kimonos draped over uh, lacquer stands, just as the uh, Tadasode screens depicted. And it is really interesting to see this small detail of a larger composition because it uh, shows that the painters uh, basically uh, zoomed in on this detail and created large scale compositions. As I mentioned, the taste of these young men and women had an influence on high ranking samurai and even court ladies. On the right side, a design book from the Kariganaya textile shop, one of the most well-known textile shops wow. in Kyoto. Um, this is dated to 1661. And on the left side, you can see a very dynamic composition with chrysanthemums and the river. It's a classic, it's a reference to Japanese literature. And there is a surviving kosode with the same pattern you can see how beautiful, how dynamic this composition is. And the back of the kosade is decorated diagonally from the um, shoulders going downwards in a diagonal uh, pattern. The river is flowing uh, down and large chrysanthemum flowers are um, hidden in between the waves of the river. Based on the design book, we can date this kimono uh, to the mid uh, 17th century. And this um, very uh, graphic style is based on uh, the influence of the kabuki mono on the Japanese fashion. If you recall the screen with the courtesans, the kimono were completely covered with small patterns, while in this composition, which dates um, just maybe 50 years after the um, creation of the screen, has a lot of empty space. And this is part of this new taste, this new idea, how to design kimono, to open it up and use it as a painterly surface and not to cover the complete background. I'm going to mention um, the Kosode pattern books or Hinagatabon. And this example from the early 18th century shows you actually how these books were used. In this um, woodblock printed book, you can see a scene of a wealthy household with many women gathering in a room. And they are looking at similar woodblock printed books with kimono patterns. Uh, the lady in the front is looking at one of these books and another lady on the uh, top is uh, making a sketch with a brush on paper looking at the pattern book. So she is modifying the design. These pattern books were um, distributed widely in Kyoto and Edo, and they were functioning as fashion magazines with the latest ideas. They include uh, patterns and they have instructions about the color. And as you can see, women could freely modify them. They could pick the color they wanted or they could play with the pattern. So it was not exactly as published in the book. And you can see um, three men in the foreground. They are the silk merchants. So they are visiting the home and they are bringing white silk. And the white silk might have a woven patterns, but it, it's not dyed. It's an undyed bolt of white fabric. And when the women will decide on the patterns and the colors, the silk merchants will take notes, take away the silk and uh, prepare the kimono in their workshops according to the design using um, either um, paste resist dyeing and embroidery or uh, the necessary techniques to create the design um, which was made by the women. Um, to show you an example how the um, Hinagata Bon or Kosoda pattern books were used to create a garment. The kosode on 
the um, left side is from the 1660s in the Mets collection, and it has a design of drying fishing nets um, decorated with gold embroidery. It's a Japanese character uh, that reads um, warbler in English. And on the right side, you can see the Kosoda pattern book. It's one of the earliest uh, published pattern books from 1667 with a very similar pattern. It's not exactly the same, but you can immediately identify the idea of the sweeping pattern, the diagonal lines. And um, it was obviously the case when somebody redesigned this um, pattern and gave instructions to the textile workshop to create an individual uh, kosode. We can also learn about the uh, history of kimono from paintings such as the beauty of the Kambun era from the late 17th century. The hanging scroll um, shows a beautiful woman in a kosode. Again, you can see that um, it's very loose. It has a very narrow obi. She is dancing, covering her face. And what is really interesting about this painting is the mounting. The painting is mounted in a silk fabric, which was actually used for a kosode. In Japan, even the tiniest pieces, the tiniest fragments are reused. You, would, you just don't throw away a very precious piece of silk. So somebody saved a 17th century kosode and used it to mount this painting. So the pattern of the kosode depicted in the painting is very, very similar to the silk which the mounter used for this particular painting. Of course, we would love to see the kosode in three dimension as if it was worn by a beautiful woman. These Arita porcelain uh, figures were very popular around the 1670s, 1690s as export porcelain um, sent to Europe. And of course, the Europeans were very curious about Japan. And these uh, figurines showing uh, beautiful women in kimono were very popular in uh, Europe. And they were uh, used to provide inspiration to create uh, garments based on uh, Japanese kimono. And before I continue with the kimono history, I would like to show you Kyoto as it looked like in the 17th century. This is a um, screen um, showing Kyoto and its surroundings. In the middle, the Kamo River. On the um, left side, the Imperial Palace. On the bottom, on the top of the middle panels is the Kiyomizu Temple. In front of it is the Yasaka Shrine. And in the foreground, you can see what would be the um, Sanjo, Shijo, Gojo area of uh, present Kyoto. And this is a very accurate depiction of the city as, as it was seen in the 17th century. And it's very lively. It's uh, one of the centers of uh, uh, textile production, business, of course, um, uh, people um, enjoy restaurants and they enjoy festivals. So this is a depiction of the Gion festival, which takes place in July. It's the uh, uh, most famous festival of Kyoto going back, back to uh, medieval times. And this scene shows um, two things about textile production in Kyoto in the 17th century. First of all, again, you can see very stylish men and women from all walks of life, commoners, servants carrying packages, um, aristocratic ladies uh, covering their head with silk um, um, garments, and uh, samurai, as well as um, people who are dressed as foreigners. It was part of the Gion Festival's unique uh, features that uh, the Japanese who encountered um, European culture in the 16th century um, dressed as um, Spaniard and Westerners. And uh, you can see the uh, balloon pants in the middle of this composition of under the striped umbrella. So those are the men dressed as foreigners. Um, 
also, I would like to call your attention to the uh, Yamaboko carts, which are pulled on the streets and they are celebrating deities. They are decorated with bolts of fabric on the left side of the screen. You can see a Yamaboko afloat with uh, bolts of fabric decorated with pines, with maple leaves, with striped textiles, all produced in Kyoto. Uh, from the 17th century, it's almost the same time when the screen um, was painted, a kosode decorated with a very beautiful composition uh, with pine trees, wisteria flowers, and on the hem, you can see a folding screen. So this is very um, typical of Japanese design. They use all kinds of patterns to decorate kimono, including paintings. And it is a great idea. It's basically a picture in the picture because the screen has a painterly composition. And um, what I would like to call your attention to that it's executed in embroidery and gold leaf on silk. So it has no um, uh, paste resist dyeing technique yet. It's uh, a late 17th century work, again, made for a wealthy woman. One of the big changes in the history of uh, Kyoto fashion was the development of the paste resist dyeing technique, which was called Yuzen in Japanese. A painter based in Kyoto called Yamazaki Yuzen Sai developed the technique, which is basically applying rice paste to the silk. And where the silk is covered with the paste, it's going to resist the dye so they could create beautiful white lines, as you can see in the detail, with the use of these new techniques. And because the paste and the dyes can be applied with a brush, it was basically hand painting a kimono. And this new technique became extremely popular and detailed compositions um, became uh, featured in the woodblock printed Kosoda pattern books. This is the time when in Kyoto, Ogata Korin became one of the most well-known painters. And um, he is seen as one of the founding figures of the Rimpa style. He was a designer who not only painted, but he was involved in designing lacquers and ceramics and created a unique um, style, which is um, very stylized. Um, the surface is uh, very flat and he used bold colors. Um, this is a, the irises at Yatsuhashi screen from the mat with the depiction of um, irises in a beautiful green and blue uh, against a gold background. And this style, this Rimpa style became extremely popular for kimono design as well. And this is the first time in uh, Kyoto's kimono history when they created a brand. The brand was identified with Ogata Korin. So his name was associated with a certain style which was published in the woodblock printed books and they were called Korin patterns, Korin moyo. And that was really a very smart move because they were um, so popular that the combination of this pattern um, became one of the most popular uh, type of kimono in the early 18th century. So I'm showing you two examples. On the left side, I would like to call your attention to the um, kimono or the kosode on the right side with autumn grasses. And on the bottom book, the right, the left side with uh, plovers flying over uh, waves. Uh, both these woodblock printed books came out in the early 18th century. And I would like to show you a fragment of a kosode in the Metz collection on the left side. Basically the combination of these two patterns. So you will see the autumn grasses and a triangle in purple with the flying plovers. So somebody took those two patterns and made a combination, a smart combination 
and creative this kosode. We have only two fragments of this kosode in the Metz collection, but uh, a screen in the National Museum of Japanese History dated to 1740 shows you half of a very, very similar kosode. And we can assume that it's basically the same design. It could have been the same kosode, but um, this is the rare occasion when uh, there is a painting with the pattern, and there is a representation in the woodblock printed book, and we have a surviving fragment, and uh, it is extremely helpful to date uh, the kosode fragment. Uh, at the beginning of my presentation, I, I mentioned no theater and no actors, because some of the early 16th century um, Kosoda survived from the no theater, and no production was very important part of Kyoto's culture. This uh, no robe, uh, this nui haku, is from the 18th century. It's decorated with gold leaf, that's why it has this beautiful sheen. The gold leaf is pressed to the silk in the background and the autumn grasses and the chrysanthemums are executed in embroidery, in silk uh, thread embroidery. It's a very elegant, beautiful uh, garment and uh, it represents the essential Kyoto taste. This 18th century kosode was made for a wealthy merchant lady. Um, in Edo period Japan from the 16th through the 19th century, um, there were four classes, the samurai, the uh, farmers and the artisans and uh, the merchants. Unfortunately, um, the hierarchy was very rigid and the Tokugawa shogunate made sure that everybody stays in uh, the social structure. Samurai were, of course, on the top of the hierarchy. Merchants, on the other hand, were on the bottom because it was um, um, thought that they are, they are not producing uh, things, but they are making money from the trade. But obviously they were very, very wealthy. And there was a competition between uh, the samurai who were on the top of the social hierarchy and uh, the merchants who were very wealthy, but they had no social weight and a merchant women uh, wanted to show their wealth by wearing beautiful garments uh, made with a lot of gold and silver application using very expensive dyes and the tokugawa shogunate regularly issued uh, decrees to forbid the use of excess luxury and this garment was made for a wealthy merchant lady it's very luxurious and it represents this uh, um, desire to um, create beautiful fabrics that can uh, show your social standing. This is an example of the paste resist dyeing, the Yuzen uh, technique, which I introduced. And the Yuzen technique, as I mentioned, uh, facilitated very complex compositions. So this garment is based on the tail of Genji and the design has lots of lots of details, including uh, fans, including scenes from the tail. And I'm showing you a small detail uh, to highlight the perfection of the technique. The execution is very, very time consuming. Each color has to be applied separately with a brush and they create gradations. You can see the um, gradation from yellow to pink and red in the rocks. And it's basically a, a painting on silk. And these were, uh, of course, very expensive, very luxurious garment, mainly created for wealthy merchant class women. Another example of the Kyoto this, this is for the summer. Uh, summers in Kyoto are very hot and humid, so um, they prefer thin, uh, unlined kimono like uh, this Remi, which was decorated again with a river and chrysanthemum patterns. Um, again, the same uh, use and dyeing technique with embroidery, and uh, they applied a little gold 
So when the woman was moving in this kimono, the gold details such as the gold leaves or the dew drops on the chrysanthemum leaves caught the light beautifully. At the same time, the pattern is a classic based on a Japanese legend of the chrysanthemum boy. And it indicates that the owner of this garment is very educated and very familiar with literature. This um, kosode with pines and interlocking squares was on view in the mat recently. I'm showing you an installation image and it looks very simple. And um, unfortunately I couldn't get a detailed image because um, I couldn't go into my office, but um, the whole kimono is created with Thai dyeing called shibori. And this was one of the most expensive techniques because it's extremely uh, time consuming to create shibori. And in the case of this garment, the whole surface is covered in uh, shibori. Um, these luxurious garments were um, so expensive that they were made as wedding trousseau items for the eldest daughters of wealthy Kyoto merchants. So it was once in a lifetime that you had a chance to get one of these garments. And these were very, very precious, very luxurious. At some point, uh, the application of, of the tie-dyeing, the kanokoshibori was forbidden. Um, I wanted to show you um, a detail of this technique and the image I'm showing to you is not from this kimono. As I mentioned, I didn't have a detail. It's from another kimono, but the same technique from the same time period. And you can see that um, it's a small detail. It's a butterfly, a paper butterfly, origami butterfly decorated with the uh, Kanoko shibori, very, very tiny squares with a tiny dot on the top. And the um, technique is um, basically the artisan hand ties the fabric in small pinches to create a pattern of undyed details. It's typically a small square with a tiny dot in the center. And when the fabric is dyed, the area which was was secured with the thread is not going to absorb the dye, so it's going to stay white. And um, in the slide, you can see a traditional Kyoto uh, uh, Kanoko Shibori technique. This is the tiniest uh, version of this technique, extremely time consuming. And nowadays there are very few people, very few artisans who can create this technique. And I'm going to go back again so you can see, this is how it looks like after you release the thread after dyeing the fabric. And it's so time consuming, it takes many, many weeks to um, create even a small portion of this tie dyeing technique. This is a um, outer robe, which was worn without a sash uh, over a kosobe on a formal occasion. So it was, um, probably a festive opportunity or a wedding. And um, it is decorated with uh, folded uh, paper butterflies, origami butterflies in pairs, like male and female, to represent the newly wedded couple. Folded, bu folded paper butterflies um, were um, very auspicious because butterfly is pronounced in Japanese the same way as you would pronounce long. So it was a wish for a long and happy marriage. Uh, wedding sets were typically made in three colors, white, black, and red. And uh, very few black survive because the black dye is um, very uh, light sensitive. And this is a rare example where you have black background with the butterfly decoration, as I mentioned, a very auspicious uh, pattern appropriate for a wedding. Um, this is an important cultural property from the 18th century. It's in Japan in the Society of Views and History. This is one of the most extravagant wedding garments I've ever seen in my life. 
This brings together all the techniques I mentioned, the paste resist dyeing, the shibori, the tie dyeing, embroidery, gold foil application. And it's really a uh, extra wagon pattern with the diagonal at the back, of course, inspired by um, 17th century design ideas. But this is the ultimate luxury in um, the history of uh, kimono. Going to the uh, late 18th, uh, early 19th century, uh, the style changes again, not the structure, but uh, as you can see, the kimonos are getting uh, longer, especially summer kimono like this one, which is unlined and it's made of Remy. It was made for a samurai lady. So the design is subdued. It's based on the tale of Genji. And the decoration is very refined, again, using gold embroidery and silk embroidery. Uh, but um, again, it's a very expensive, very beautifully executed uh, summer robe. This is also for a samurai lady. Um, it's an over robe with fans and flowers. Again, it's very subtle. It's not as um, loud. It's not as um, extravagant as the wedding kimono I showed you. The wedding kimono was made for a wealthy merchant lady. Very few garments from uh, the aristocracy made in Western collection. They were not sold on the art market. So uh, I was very lucky when I um, acquired this one, which was made in the mid 19th century in Kyoto. And I was very excited because I know who was the owner. Her name was, um, Lady Yuki, and she was the daughter of the head priest of the Higashi Honganji Temple in Kyoto. And that was super exciting to know who was the owner because um, it helped me to date the kimono. And for aristocratic ladies, again, the design is very different. They use only embroidery, they don't use paste dresses dyeing, and the design is very classy birds and flowers. It's coming from Chinese painting. There is um, no, um, not as uh, flashy again as, as um, the ones worn by the merchant class ladies, but um, it's beautifully embroidered. I'm showing you a detail with um, the phoenix bird, and you can see that the um, gold thread is very, very high quality. The embroidery is very thick. Another uh, kimono in our galleries that was made for an aristocratic lady in Kyoto using purple, which was one of the aniline dyes imported from the West. It was very expensive and a similar idea. The design is very subdued, very classy, and uh, the decoration is mainly embroidery. But finally, I wanted to include a slide from the same uh, time period from the mid 19th century to show all kinds of men's uh, fashion. This is the time when, of course, uh, they started to wear Western garments. So you can see a mix of uh, Japanese kimono with uh, uniforms inspired by the West and Western outfits. Uh, again, the men's kimono are relatively simple with stripes and um, lots of brown, dark green, uh, gray. And um, again, this is the time when on the streets of Kyoto, you could see all these garments at the same time. So that was my little introduction to the history of Kyoto. And as you had a wonderful um, exhibition focusing on Chiso, um, I'm going to close um, the discussion with a slide of the um, Chiso um, shop in Kyoto and one of their uh, beautiful wedding garments that was in inspired by the earlier example I showed to you. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. I think um, it was a lot of information, but um, I'm happy to answer to your 
questions and at the at the very end i have a few slides um to show what my exhibition is going to be about but i'm going to show it at the very end of this uh program thank you dr bing that was beautiful it was amazing to see all that's in your collection as well as from other places so i will take questions we first did have already some questions in the chat so i'll start with those um the first one for you is were the no actors kimonos worn owned by a man or a woman? So no theater was based on male actors. So uh, female roles are played by male actors in the no theater. The second question is, what is the state of kimono making today? So that's a complicated question. Um, so there are all kinds of kimono made in Kyoto today. Um, there are um, commercial kimono shops where you can buy relatively inexpensive kimono made um, of, of uh, cotton or um, inexpensive materials. They even use um, polyester and um, relatively inexpensive material for a um, kimono that you can uh, put on. There are kimono shops like Chiso producing expensive silk kimono for special occasions for women uh, involved with ikebana flower arrangements or tea ceremony, which require traditional kimono and for new year celebrations or weddings. Um, in Kyoto, there are women who regularly wear kimono. So when you walk on the street, you will see women in kimono. I'm not talking about, I haven't even mentioned the entertainment business because that's a different story. So I'm leaving it out for, for today. But um, women who, um, as I mentioned, work in a restaurant would put on kimono every day in a traditional restaurant or uh, singers or actresses or, um, people who, um, of course, um, work um, in, in traditional businesses um, would, would put on kimono and those are more expensive and made of um, high quality materials. There are famous kimono designers like brands, as I mentioned about Ogata Korin, he was the first who became a brand. And there are living national treasures who make uh, very expensive kimono because they use um, uh, use and dyeing, hand painted kimono, and those kimono are really the, the top. So those are the, the luxury items. Um, some of these kimono, if you use traditional use and um, can take as long as six months to make. And an artist can make only two or three a year. I mean, it's just a rough estimate, but they cannot make many. That's, that's the point. So they are expensive. And uh, those artists are very famous. They create exhibitions, kimono, which are given or acquired by museums. And they also make kimono. Uh, these are really for um, very special occasions or for, for an actress to receive a prize or something. So like an Oscar. Um, so there are lots of lots of uh, types and many, many levels of kimono production in Kyoto. And uh, young people like to uh, uh, sort of recut old kimono. So they inherit their mother's kimono, but they think it's old fashioned. They don't want to put it on, but they cut it up. They make mini skirts out of it, or they put the patches on their jeans. So there is a lot of creative movement. And um, I'm very happy to see that uh, kimonos are being recycled rather than just thrown out. Hmm. A question related to that from Joyce that she was told in Aramiso a few years ago that the handmade shibori industry was dying out as there weren't younger people coming up to replace the mostly elderly artisans who are making these beautiful fabrics. Um, is anyone still making the elaborate silk kimono? Um, but I think if you could speak to the traditional artisan part of that question, that would be great. Yes. So unfortunately, um, not only the shibori, but other techniques are also dying um, because there are no young people interested in uh, continuing these traditions. And um, 
some of these are very expensive and um, it's not a good business. So um, it's, it's true that, as I mentioned for the Shibori technique, there are very few artisans who can um, still produce the traditional, very, very tiny ones, as, as I showed in the slide, this really tiny um, Shibori stitches. Um, and uh, also the tools are disappearing. So specialized brushes or other tools that necessary to make a kimono are not produced anymore. And um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a network. There were people producing the gold leaf, there were people producing the gold thread, there were people producing the brushes. And then there was an artist who used all this to make a kimono, but they are losing the, the base because there are no workshops producing the tools anymore. And without the tools, they cannot produce the same quality or they cannot produce certain techniques. So unfortunately, the whole network is breaking up. And I did put in the chat, Chizo, who made our kimono, has a lovely video that shows artisans at work, including the barrel tie dyeing. So that's a yes. nice video to see. Um, Leslie asked if you could show the slide with a close up of Okuni dancing and talk more about how the early riverbed kabuki influenced fashion of both men and women. Uh, can we do it at the end? So I don't want to screen share, but I would show my slides for the upcoming exhibition and I will start with that slide. Yes, and there's a woman, um, Studio Hyacinth, I don't know if you want to speak. She is a kimono maker, I believe, in Arlington, Mass, who has been on the chat. I don't know if you want to unmute and tell us your experience. Hi. Hi, my name is Nobuko Yoshihara. I'm I'm coming from Japan. I'm original Japanese, and I just want to show. I'm I'm so happy. Doctor shared my most favorite kimono pattern, tabane no shi. Mm -hmm. This oh. is my my twenty years old celebrate kimono. Let me, Let me spotlight it. Mm -hmm. This is a tabane no shi. Yes. Yeah, it's a mo most of my favorite pattern in kimono. It's very elaborate and very appropriate for a wedding. It's very auspicious. Exactly. This is a very, you know, actually I wore this kimono when, when I was a, my wedding time. Oh, so, wonderful. This is my wedding style. Uh -huh. And this is my family and I wear the same kimono for my wedding. Yes. Yeah. Are you from Kyoto? No, I'm originally come from near the Tokyo. Oh, but uh -huh. of course I love Kyoto very much. Yeah. Yes, this I'm, pattern is still very popular in Kyoto. That's right. And the most very, you know, gathering the happiness. It's a Tabane no shi is my most favorite pattern in kimono. I'm very appreciate you share the Tabane no shi pattern tonight. Thank, Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask directly? Maybe not. All right, then if you wanted to share your extra slides there, Dr. Binchik, I think this yes. would be a great time. I am doing that. Okay, so I promised to go back and um, show the Riverbank Kabuki. And then I will show the extra slides. Okay, here it is. Um, so uh, first of all, um, she is dressed as a young samurai and um, she has very extravagant accessories. So she was very often depicted wearing a cross, which is of course coming from Europe when the uh, missionaries visited Japan at the end of the 16th century. And uh, uh, she is really one of the uh, epitomes of the kabukimono who 
came up with new ideas about combination of colors, uh, new kinds of patterns, and how to put on the kimono. You can see that the obisesh is very low, and the, the garment is just a very loose robe. You can see the undergarment, um, and um, it, it, it was not something that he would uh, see on the street. It was very provocative. And um, the musicians surrounding her also uh, look very extravagant. And that was the uh, kabukimono style, which sort of denied the traditions and broke away from the traditions and then helped to develop the kambun kosode, which um, I also mentioned in the 1660s, especially the diagonal composition and the very graphic patterns and the bright colors. That was one of the um, characteristics of um, the style using very bright colors, very um, vivid colors with large patterns. And then um, I will show a few slides from the upcoming Metropolitan show. Okay, so um, it's going to um, be about the influence of Western fashion on Japanese art. So um, from the Meiji period, from the 19th century, department stores um, were established in Japan based on Western ideas, including the Mitsukoshi, the Takashimaya, the Daimaru. Some of these had um, history going back to the Edo period, but the new Western style marketing um, had a major impact on how to sell kimono and how to design kimono. So many of these department stores started to show Western garments together with kimono. They were displayed side by side. These are shop windows of um, the department store in, in Tokyo. And as you can see, they even put a automobile in the background to show that the Western fashion represents the future. That's, that's the modernization. And I'm very interested in that um, conversation between traditional kimono and Western fashion. And um, I was looking at the influence of Western design and Western ideas um, and in the exhibition, I'm going to juxtapose kimono with uh, European and American designers. So um, this is a, a summer kimono with swirl patterns. It's very art deco from the 1920s, 1930s with an American designer who um, created these beach uh, pajamas, uh, basically the same abstract, uh, bold pattern and I'm interested in the idea that for the summer, what kind of patterns were popular in uh, Europe and in, in um, not only Europe, in the West and in Japan. And um, uh, again, this is how the um, modern kimono were marketed. And I'm interested in um, the catalog production of Mitsukoshi and Takashimaya because they were promoting the kimono as uh, they have seen in Western department stores. And I'm looking at the influence of uh, that as well. And um, this is again, a great example when uh, kimono had an impact on the West, it's uh, the other way. So the summer kimono with arrow patterns from the 1920s, it's of course a, a summer kimono. And next to it is a design by Paul Poiré uh, called Arrow of Gold, which has the exact same pattern for a cocktail dress from 1925. The same idea from the 1930s. Um, it's an American uh, brand, um, Roselle and Stuart Davis. And it's basically an abstract pattern. And uh, the same idea was captured by Mason Kimono by Japanese uh, designers at the same time. And um, that's a new angle uh, because we were aware of the influence of kimono on the West, but you now I'm looking um, at the other direction and see if we can learn more about what happened. 
And this is my last slide to show a child's kimono. Uh, there are very few um, children kimono uh, because of course they were discarded, but this is a great example. It's a padded kimono for a child. It's, it's tiny, it's, it's super cute. And the design is Mickey Mouse. And it was just uh, after uh, Disney designed this um, pattern. So the Japanese immediately picked it up and created this um, child's kimono. And I think that this captures the curiosity of the, of the Japanese designers. They were always on the look for new patterns and they were very quick to uh, pick up European and American design ideas. Thank you. I think we'll have to get a group together from Worcester to come see your exhibition at the Met. You have two questions that arose, um, both about the, if you could define the Mason style and tell us when the design started. So Mason um, was produced from around uh, the early 20th century and these were ready made kimono. So before um, that time, each kimono was individually made. As I mentioned, uh, you had to pick a color and you had to have somebody who made it for you or your mother made it for you, but you couldn't go into a shop and just buy it. It started only in the late 19th century after the Westerners um, came to Japan. And it was a new idea that you can go to a department store and you can just grab something and take it home. And um, they were mass produced. They were uh, very seasonal because they wanted to sell a lot. So they started to promote kimono according to the seasons. So there were patterns associated with the summer, spring, autumn, winter. And from the 1920s, women started to join the workforce and they had lose money. And again, that was something new before they had no money or the money was um, controlled by the husband or the father. Uh, women in the Meiji period, they had no own income. They had no their own money. They had to ask for it. But from the 1920s, there was a big change in Japanese society and women started to work in restaurants. Um, they started to work in offices and um, they wanted to be fashionable. They cut their hair. This is the Art Deco uh, style as well. So um, they, they look uh, very westernized at that time. And the Meisen kimono was produced uh, mainly around the Tokyo area. And Chichibu is one of the uh, famous Meisen uh, production areas. They used uh, relatively cheap silk. The silk was graded A, B, C, D, depending on the quality. And Meissen was produced from B and C level silk. And um, they developed uh, techniques which uh, allowed the mass production of these kimonos, which were relatively inexpensive compared to the previous um, individually made kimonos. And one last question for you. Someone wants to know the current price for a high end kimono. How high? How high end? <laughs> so uh, one produced by a living national treasure, which I mentioned is really the, the top, can be as expensive as I would say $80,000. That's, that's a really expensive one. And if you go to a place uh, like uh, Chiso, it's going to depend on what kind of technique you request. If you want to have lots of gold embroidery, the price is going up. If you want to have a lot of uh, tiny shibori, then the price is going to go up. So the price depends on the technique and the design and um, like the wedding kimonos, I, I've showed those are the luxury items. But if you just want to have a nice silk kimono, which doesn't have any um, additional decoration and you go to a less well-known shop, you can get it much, much cheaper. Well, thank you so much for taking time for these questions, Dr. Vingshik. We so appreciate your time. This was a great presentation. Um, thank you, everyone. Someone wants to know what the best way to follow your work at the Met is. 
Oh, um, we have a website uh, you can visit and um, um, Eileen, of course, can um, share my contact and I'm very happy to answer more questions if you if you have uh, more questions about kimono history. Well, thank you so much. You're getting a lovely thank yous in the chat. Thank we you. appreciate your time and we will definitely be following your upcoming kimono show. So thank you for sharing that yes. with us. It's supposed to be opening next June. Great. Well, we'll keep an eye out for that. Thank you all. And if you're interested in learning more, our last program to go along with the Kimono Show will be next Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Um, we'll have Michiko Karata dancing in Kimono and sharing a bit about how she wears Kimono. So we hope you'll join us and we hope you have a great night and hopefully you won't get too much snow wherever you are. So thank, thank you, you so again. much. It was my pleasure. Very thank good to you see so you. Much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.